Hello, good evening, and thank you for joining Y4SD Conference 2020. The Jamaican National Anthem is a national prayer. As is customary at all Y4SD events, we start with this prayer because we believe that Jamaica and the world really needs it. We will now play the national anthem of Jamaica. <laughs> that was the national anthem of Jamaica sung by Richie Stevens in 2013. Our host for this evening is Ms. Danalyn Swaby, a communication practitioner with over five years experience managing the communication portfolio for local and regional climate change projects. She has present, represented Jamaica and the Caribbean at the United Nations Youth Climate Summit in New York COP25 Climate Change Conference in Spain, and Shevening COP Climate Emergency in the UK. This Y4SD member, Dana Lynn, is a 2019 Shevening Scholar and the creator and host of Global Yadi, a podcast series exploring culture, climate, and sustainable development with people across the globe. We welcome you all to tonight's session, and I now hand over to Dana Lynn. Thank you so much, Rochelle, for that introduction. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to day two of the Y4SD Conference 2020, Making Waves. And that's exactly what we will be doing today. Did someone say, cannonball? <laughs> just in case you're wondering if I'm excited, I know you are too. And just like me, you're ready to jump into today's session, Your Marine Lifestyle, Life in Water. And if you're familiar, and I'm sure you're all familiar with the work of Youth for Sustainable Development. And as our name suggests, everything that we do is linked to the Sustainable Development Goal. So today we'll be exploring goal number. Let me see. Um, can somebody drop in the comments section? Uh, goal number what? Let me tease out which goal is today's session aligned with when it comes to Sustainable Development Goals. 
14. Thank you so much, Carrie, Carrie Ann. Goal number 14, life below water. Now, just before we get our feet wet, sorry to be overloading with the metaphors, but it's just the excitement of the, the riveting series. I would love to acknowledge our sponsors. Y4SD Conference 2020 is powered by JPS and Jamaica Rums. And as I said before, the conference theme making waves and i know for some of us who would have joined yesterday we had a very engaging session so that was your engaged lifestyle community nation and world today as i mentioned before your marine lifestyle life in water tomorrow we will explore your agriculture lifestyle and that's getting some it's of a buzz getting some good and well-needed buzz exploring agriculture looking at life on land we're going to rest on Sunday and Monday we'll, we'll resume things looking at your wellness lifestyle, mind, body and soul. If there was ever a time that we need to be doing checks into wellness, it is now. So absolutely, we had to have that on, on board for you all. And then on Tuesday, we'll wrap things up. The Tuesday, July 28th with your sustainable lifestyle, healthy homes. So five days five ways to cultivate social change and we're happy that you're here for it if i didn't say it before i want to welcome everyone who is joining us and also throw a welcome to people who will be joining in, in the wider cyberspace because i do know that we are recording live on youtube so if you happen to be checking in now or later welcome and thanks for clocking into this very exciting series with us no, let me make sure that I didn't forget anything. Yes, now I told you all about the exciting um, lineup that we have for this year's summit, but how to register. So if you're following Y4SD on our social media platforms on Instagram, Y4SDJA, click the link in our bio, and that's the registration link, of course. And on Facebook, Youth for Sustainable Development, or information is there. That's how you register. Please don't keep the information to yourself. You're supposed to be sending out in your WhatsApp group. You're supposed to be sharing the IG stories. Like technology makes it so easy. You have no excuse to not be spreading this awesomeness. This is sustainable development gospel. So we have to spread it all over. So please get to sharing, get to using our hashtags, hashtag Y4SD, Y4SDC 2020. Hashtag make waves, hashtag Y4SG summer. No, I know it's on Zoom and I'm doing a lot to kind of convey the energy and everything, but sometimes we want to feel like I'm, I'm not talking to myself right now. So just to get in a little bit of icebreaker, I want everyone who is online right now, if you can, you need supposed to fix up yourself and, and look presentable. So if you can turn on your mics and your cameras, if you feel so comfortable, like I said before. And I want everybody to say with me, let's make waves. So let me see those camera. I'm not right. Let's so waves. <laughs> I'm going too fast. Let's make waves. All right. Oh, let's start. Okay. We didn't you see this choir fall. The wife for SD choir is not our strong suit. So I hear Dave and I think in the background. So after three, one, two, three. Let's, let's make, make waves. waves. There we go. Wavy. All right. I'm too excited about this conference right now. But I love that. Absolutely love the energy that was coming forth. Now we're going to go right into introducing our speaker for today. And I am excited because this was a man, like when, as a teenager, he couldn't swim. And now he is one of the top marine biologists in Jamaica. And it's going to be, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce to you our guest speaker for this session. Dr. Dane Boudou is a marine ecologist with expertise in marine invasive alien species, fisheries management, and marine protected areas. He currently holds a Bachelor of Science degree in zoology and botany and a Doctor of Philosophy degree in zoology marine sciences from the University of the West Indies, where he also served as a tenured faculty member for almost a decade. More recently, he served as the CEO and research director for the Alligator Head Foundation, 
focusing on marine protected areas. Jane is a widely published author in scientific peer-reviewed journals and books in ocean conservation. He has worked closely with the United Nations on ocean issues, serving on various bodies, both for Jamaica and in his own right. Jane is also certified as a PADI Ma or Paddy, Paddy, Master Instructor, an Advanced Rebreather Diver, an Emergency First Response, First Aid CPR AED Instructor, as well as a Hyperbaric Recompression Chamber Safety Director. If you're not following, just know that all these things sound like it has to do with ocean. <laughs> he has safely conducted, get this, he has safely conducted over 8,000 scuba dives and is also an avid underwater photographer. He has both studied and experienced the impacts of climate change on small islands, and more importantly, developed solutions to adapt and increase resilience. He's experienced in over 35 countries. 35 countries has given Dane a broad approach to climate change, and these stories resonate throughout his work in ocean conservation. Dane is currently the director of the Bay Academy, Bay Equatorium, based in San Francisco, California, USA. Absolutely amazing. This, um, if we to say that we're excited is an understatement. So today, Dr. Buddha will be taking us underwater with him. We'll be diving into how our marine lifestyle and habits can bring about social change. So ladies and gentlemen, I brought my swim cap. I'm going to just pretend that my glasses is my goggles because we're just gonna go underwater and explore. Please help me to welcome Dr. Dane Budu. Hello, everyone. Are you hearing me okay? Yes. All right. So I thought that um, you know when I saw the the, the title for today's talk about life underwater, life in water. I figured I'd take the opportunity to show you how underwater is and do the talk from underwater. Um, so we're right here at the Aquarium of the Bay, um, 3,000 miles from Jamaica, uh, on the U.S. West Coast in San Francisco, California. Um, I've been here since the shutdown, um, pretty much locked away for the last four months, uh, but trying to make things happen. So I wanted to, to share with you some of, you know, not a lecture, but I'm just gonna steal images up, images from across the world, some of the things that I've been doing. And in an effort to pretty much share with you some of the issues surrounding these creatures, you know, um, some of them you are familiar with and probably most of them you will be familiar with, but to share a little bit and start the conversations or increase the conversation about some of these issues, some of the issues that Jamaica and many other small island developing states are battling at the moment. So um, I probably showed a slideshow for maybe 30 minutes, 25 minutes there about. Um, small video clips they will be in there as well. So hopefully that works okay. And then we can take some questions um, at the end as well. So I want you to enjoy the view behind the tunnels a little bit, and then you can come back in a little while as well. So let me just share my screen real quick. Um, we can need permission to share my screen from the host. But then, I mean, if you're there, can you just give me permission to share the screen? Okay, I'm here. I think, um, Rochelle, if Rochelle is still here, um, Rochelle is- Oh, Rochelle. Right. Okay. Well, we tested it earlier. I know it works perfectly. Okay, gotcha. I see that I can do that now. One second. Are you guys see my screen now? Yes, we're seeing. Perfect. All right. So let's jump in a little bit. All right. So let me just get, get things moving a bit. So of course, you guys all know about the lion fishing. I'll talk a little bit about the lion fishing in a little while as well. But I wanted to take it to a journey. And from the air all the way down to the bottom of the ocean, 
all the way across to areas such as Congo in the South Pacific. Um, we have done several expeditions and uh, just to share some of these things that I've seen and put things together in context of Jamaica and the Caribbean as well. Um, so this is a photo that I took from a, a helicopter and I tell you, when we were figuring out, you know, where should we demark as the East Portland Fifth Sanctuary, uh, this was the first marine protected area in Portland and this was done back in 2015. Um, we thought that we should take some images of above water, I mean, from, from the skies. And that helped, you know, that helped to kind of show some of the topography um, underwater and the bathymetry underwater as well. And as you can see this image, you know, this is very characteristic of all of the North Coast reef areas. You know, you have these spur and groove formations leading up from these um, fringing reefs right up to the coastline. Very beautiful colors and everything, and it shows the relationship between coral reefs, seagrass, and the coastline. Sometimes it's mangrove areas, uh, sometimes it's you know other wetland areas as well. But it's where the connectivity comes into play. You know? So I'm going to show you. I'm, sh I'm showing you this video, and this video. It's from the Pijo Bank. Um, I did some work on the Pijo Bank um, in 2015. And I came across this reef area, and thankfully it's in the um, fish sanctuary that's designated out there. But it reminds me of images, only images that I've seen of North Coast reefs back in the 1960s, the 1950s, um, you know, showing the Acropora palmata, the stagon coral and elecorn corals growing well, you know, the cervicornis, the, the palmatas, really beautiful, healthy, and forming a nice thicket. And this is a, this is so characteristic of what a healthy reef should look like. Guess what? This is Jamaica. It's unbelievable that it's still Jamaica, all right? And I was very, very impressed. And it gave me confidence that this, you know, we can actually go back to this kind of situation. Of course, you know, it all starts from a tiny little polyp, a tiny little coral polyp that looks like a, like a jellyfish with tentacles. And those tiny little green blobs that you see inside the tentacles are what, like, that's like the food maker, it's like the factory, the engine behind corals. These are the zooxanthellae. And without these zooxanthellae, this, this algae living inside, um, the corals will die. Um, you heard about the thing about coral bleaching. When corals lose these zooxanthellae, they will end up becoming bleached. So they lose all the color, they lose the food source, and eventually if this continues, they will die. So summertime is normally where we find higher temperatures in the water and a lot there's a direct link with coral bleaching and warming temperatures. Many polyps come together to form a beautiful colony. Colonies come together to form a reef system. So something that people probably don't recognize, seagrass are flowers. So these are seagrass areas. This is a seagrass area in Cayman Islands. Uh, I was asked to look at the effects of a power plant and the expansion of a power plant on the seagrass area surrounding that area. And, you know, we saw some things floating in the water one day and I looked carefully and it was actually flowers, flowers from the seagrass reproducing. And the seagrass are flowering plants. We can see the flowers right there, they look like little stars, and they just blanket the entire area. So, you know, people oftentimes miss these, miss these things, but because I was spending hours and hours in the seagrass bed, uh, it did allow you to notice small things. You find big things as well, of course, people always love sea stars, and these brightly colored ones are very, very obvious um, in the seagrass bed. Of course, they feed on algae and some of the seagrass as well. One of the, you know, less flamboyant, uh, but very important and very unique kind of creature is the, is the sponge. So just like you have, you know, um, large sponges, you have small sponges. This is, a, this is a tube sponge. And these are pretty much a, a colonial set of animals. And they still to feed of, uh, they still to feed particles coming out and that siphon that you see, that hole, that cavity that you see, 
especially the water coming back out. So they will pull water through the sides of these canals and then take out the particles out of them and push it all the way back to the, the, the siphon. This is a, a, a small puffer fish, okay? Um, <clears throat> very, very unique, very slow swimming, very pointed mouth, uh, and they normally feed on it invertebrates. Uh, but this is one of those unique little swimmers as well. Um, lots of people like to eat these guys, they have the blue striped guns, and behind it is a dog, is a dog um, snapper. Um, these are the ones that I tend to go out, fishermen tend to go after these ones as well. Um, this was in Cayman Islands, I believe. And I like taking pictures in Cayman Islands because the fish come really, really close to you. They're not afraid because they have such strict fishing laws that some of the fish haven't even seen a spear fisherman ever before. So divers, you know, when I'm diving there, it's, it's always nice to take photos because fish stay still. They just want it, want to be photographed. They're not scampering off like in Jamaica. Um, sea turtles, everybody loves sea turtles. And uh, this is one of those, you know, <clears throat> hawksbill turtles. Uh, pretty old guy, you can see the, 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 the skew, uh, a little bit worn out and damaged and everything. Um, but if you look just in front, wait, I hope you can see my little pointer. Um, this is called a garden eel. And these guys will pop out of the sand, they will feed from particles going by, and they will just retract all the way back down. Um, this is a sea lion. So I went diving in, I think it's Catalina Island, this one, no, or Mexico, or the Pacific side. Um, it was very, very cold water, and we came across um, quite, a, quite a bit of, um, of sea lions. Um, they were friendly for the most part. Um, the females were a lot more friendly than the dominant male. The dominant male was very territorial. Um, so he would come across and pretty much bark at you, uh, trying to get you out of the way as much as possible. So there was a sea lion just coming straight down at me. Uh, very, very curious. They would come and you know pick at your wetsuit and things like that as well. Um, this is a grouper, and I'm right underneath the grouper. So you can kind of get an impression how big this thing is. Um, the, this group, or we found this group in a marine protected area. And there were quite a bit of them. Um, 20 years before that, there were none. But fishermen decided to set up a marine protected area um, to bring back these kind of species, and it's working. So this is a marine protected area in Cabo Pumo, Mexico, in the Baja Peninsula. You can see some other shots of group of here. And if you look around, I mean, apart from the two that's right in front of the camera, just below that, you have others in, in the, in the, in, uh, behind as well. So there are large schools of groupers all around. And these are highly sought after commercial species. Um, so I got a chance, uh, I was asked to do a fish count in this marine park. So I'm there with my slate, trying to count fish and write fish down. And, you know, if it was, if they were staying still, it would be great. But when you, but when you have something looking like this, uh, the plate is jitter for you. How do you count that? I mean, they're all over the place. But, you know, they, they, I'm trying to measure them and count them. And for some reason, they, they decided not to cooperate and move <laughs> really, really fast. Came across schools of fish like this as well in the marine park. Uh, you have a group of rights in the middle. And then you have all these snappers all the way around it. and just pools of fish. And this is a very barren era 20 years ago. So, you know, recovery is possible, recovery is probable, and recovery has happened. Um, we just need to decide that we want it. And once you say that we want it, it will happen. A lot of things, a lot of people don't realize that the ocean, they don't really, the ocean doesn't really need us. The species in the ocean really need humans. They just need humans to leave them, let them be, let them do what they are built to do. They will recover. We just have to give them the opportunity to. Uh, this one, well, okay, we came across these um, sea crates, they call them, but it, you know, people call them a sea snake. Um, they are not venomous, like, our, like their cousins, but they can bite you. 
<laughs> really painful as well. Um, a couple of these guys, we came across them. This was in um, a place called Nawi, which is about two to three hours away from the south of New Zealand in the Pacific. Um, so we were down at about 100 feet and these guys were just down there with us. And these are reptiles, you know, they have to go back to the surface to breathe, but they'll be down with us for a while. Um, sometimes, sometimes you get a little bit excited. Sorry, I was kind of screaming when I saw the, the humpback whales. Um, so that's a mom and, his, and, and her calf. Um, came right up to the boat, so we just decided to, to jump in and take some pictures. Uh, but they were there for quite a while with us. So this is a giant clam. And, you know, it's, it's, it's huge. Um, so I kind of just, you know, find my hands right beside it and it starts to close the valves. I just want to see it moving. Very, very beautiful. Very sought after species as well for fish, as, as a fishery. And they were very, very prevalent. This was in Tonga, in the South Pacific. Now we have these little guys. These are called the humbug damselfish. And if you look at a tiny little piece of coral, and look how many fish are supported by that coral. So just wait and see them come out. And I snap my fingers and then scamper back in. But look how many fish are being supported by that one small three-dimensional structure. And that's what coral restoration does, provides that three-dimensional structure to provide habitat for fish. So some more of um, the diversity that you find there. You know, so this is a tiny little hole. I can't remember where this one was, somewhere in the Caribbean, I think. Um, <clears throat> we have all of these tiny mycid shrimp that you see scattered around these fish. And, you know, some of them are being eaten by smaller fish, but it just shows you, you know, the commercially important fish because the snapper that's in the background is highly sought after in Jamaica and many Caribbean countries. This is a queen angel fish and probably one of the most beautiful fish that we find on a shallow reef system. Um, unfortunately, you know, it's very easy for a spear fisherman to shoot this. And when you have a lack of snappers and groupers and other fish, you know, fishermen are turning these species as well, which is unfortunate. Uh, this is a hogfish. Um, again, one of the fish that you tend not to find nowadays on a fishing beach because they're severely overfished. It's a very easy fish to, sh to, to shoot. So what happened is that, you know, you, a, a spear fisherman will come across this fish and what it will do is pretty much turn sideways. And it became such an easy target for fishermen. So they were heavily fished out in Jamaica. Okay, this is a sea cucumber. And um, this one is on the bottom in the sand, just scampering off and, you know, just scoring the bottom for algae. Um, very, very friendly. I mean, right now there's a market um, for them in Jamaica, an illegal market. The sea cucumber fish is, is banned. So we still have people fishing sea cucumbers, drying them and selling them to the Asian market, which is not a good sign. Um, recently, Jamaica did a survey across the island and, and the island shelf uh, to see if there, you know, there could be a fishery that can be supported for sea cucumbers and the data was not showing that, so that's why it was fine. This is a, um, a file fish. And the thing about these file fishes is that they can change color. And they can change color within a minute. They can be swimming over a rocky area of the reef, goes over the sandy area, and immediately will change color. They're not very fast swimmers, but they use the element of camouflage to actually guard them against predation. This file fish has this trigger right at the top of its head. And what that does is that if a predator grabs it, it will stick the predator in its mouth and hopefully get a chance to be released. But they're not fast swimmers, so they have to come up with ways to hide and ways to defend themselves passively. Uh, this is one of those grunts that you know, fishermen love right now, and you're hardly seeing them so easily in Jamaica. You find small pockets, especially in the fish sanctuaries, but outside of the sanctuaries, it's very hard to find these fish nowadays. All right, everybody's favorite, the parrotfish. Now, this is a princess parrotfish. 
in the terminal phase. The parapets look very different at different stages of their life. Um, they change color pretty much. Um, they, they will look totally different. But this is a princess parrot fish, and this is a stoplight parrot fish. And you know, a, you know, of course, the issue with parrot fish, of course, you know, it's so important to have on the reef system that many countries have actually banned the fishing of uh, for parrot fish and the removal of parrot fish from the reef system. It's a very progressive move. Um, something that I endorse. We have to figure out a way to implement it in Jamaica. Um, people love parrot fish in Jamaica, but at the same time, you know, we have to make sure that the parrot fish they are providing the needs for everybody. So safeguarding our coastlines, not just for fish. The parrot fish is not there, it's not in the in the sea just for us to eat it. It's there for many other reasons. Uh, we just have to make up our mind in terms of which one of those purposes are most important to us, you know, and decide that hey, if we want parrot fish around. Whether it's to eat, whether it's to just, you know, look beautiful on a reef of, for divers or to protect our reefs so that they can produce, uh, produce the protection that we want and produce sand as well. Um, we have to make up our mind, you know, we want the parrot fish around. So conservation scientists are not against, I mean, the, the conservation scientists and fisheries, fisheries, you know, persons involved in fisheries, all the fishermen and everything, they're after the same goal. They want the parrot fish to remain. Fishermen want the parrot fish to remain, you know. They don't have to figure out how to make it sustainable. And if they want to fish it, won't you want to have it around for, for the rest of um, eternity? You know, we want to make sure that it's there. So we have to make sure that we do the right thing. Um, this is an eel. Uh, what are those, you know, very, very flamboyant, a sharp, a sharp tail eel. Um, it's very curious. You know, that's when it came right up to my camera. Um, and we're just posing for, for the camera. That, that's it right there. Uh, very, very beautiful, very, very bold, not very shy. It becomes the divers quite, uh, quite easily. It's not dangerous at all. Um, I had the pleasure to come in contact with about 30 of these whale sharks once um, in Mexico. Um, they were in a small bay. Not very deep bay, about 20 feet deep, but they came there to feed and to reproduce. And, you know, got the opportunity to have my photo taken right beside one. Um, that one is about 25 feet long, 26 feet long when you measure it from here to, 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 to the head. And it was graceful, it was beautiful, you know, we didn't want to touch it, we don't touch any of these creatures. Um, they're very, very sensitive to these things. But a very powerful yet graceful creature, biggest fish in the world. Here's another one. It's a grouper. Um, this is a tiger grouper that I found on a reef in the Cayman Islands. Um, again, a highly sought after fish. This one I found at a cleaning station. So it's just kind of hanging around with its mouth open, and you have you know small cleaner shrimp and wrasses going in and out of its mouth and picking up parasites, et cetera, um, from inside the mouth. The nice little cleaning station. This is the orange spotted five fish, uh, very similar. Um, this one bit the camera. Um, very, very, you know, very docile kind of creature, but very sharp teeth as well. This is a stop right parrot fish as well. Um, very big one, this is a terminal. Prior fish meaning that this is the last phase of its life. So this is, you know, very mature, very big prior fish. Um, unfortunately, this was not in Jamaica. Though I have seen recently in some of the fish sanctuaries prior fish um, getting to this size. Uh, very, very welcoming. It's a tiger grouper, and there were a few of them hanging out on this wreck that I found. Um, this is about 90 feet deep, 85 feet deep, if I remember correctly. But they love these kind of structures. They like hanging around. They're not very fast swimmers. They will just stick around for a little bit, which makes them very, very beautiful and easy to photograph. I'll tell a little story about these two guys. Well, this guy and this girl. Um, these are the French angelfish. And when French angelfish are younger, smaller, um, they will pair up and they pair up for life. Um, so typically, when we're diving and we see one, 
we just look around the, look around the bend for the next one. They're always swimming in pairs. Uh, this is a, 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 a schoolmaster snapper. Uh, this one came right up to the camera, uh, showing showing me his, you know very sharp teeth and uh, but I like taking fishes like this because you're almost like you're you're looking straight into the, the spirit of this fish. And I remember posting it on social media and asking people, you know, what do they think the fish is thinking about? And you should have seen some of those comments. Uh, this is a scorpion fish, one of the most venomous fish under the water. Uh, related to the land fish, which I'll speak about in a little while. But the scorpion fish, as you can see right here, just sits, just relaxes, very sharp venomous spines on the back, uh, on the dorsal side, as well as on the head, and some of the fins as well. So if you happen to accidentally step on one of these things, it's a really painful thing. You know, people get swelling. It tends not to kill people. But it's extremely painful. Uh, you guys might, you guys would like this one, and I can tell you that the timing of this talk was good because the paper from this work um, was published two days ago in Nature. And Nature is one of the top environmental journals worldwide. Um, so I'll show you. So basically, what we did, and we did this in 38 countries. So we deployed these things called beta-view remote underwater cameras. And it has a little bait box, a little black box that you see right there. And we deploy them in certain areas and we're looking for sharks. That's what we're looking for, sharks. And the camera that's mounted on it as well would you know, photograph the shark, take videos of the shark. And then we use the fin markings to identify one tiger shark from another tiger shark. This one in the video is a tiger shark. I'll show you this one. This one's from um, the Pijo Bank. And this is a pretty, pretty big tiger shark. And interestingly, um, when we put this camera system down, there were no sharks inside. And this video was like a few minutes after we went back into the boat. And then of course, to, we allowed this to stay and then we recovered the camera. Um, it, was, it was nearby and we just did not see the shark. So you can check out um, Nature, you go on Nature's website, and you should see this um, Global Assessment of Sharks paper that was published on Wednesday. One of the things that I do as well, um, a project in Costa Rica, a place called Cocos Island. Uh, Cocos Island is 500 miles off the Pacific coast of Costa Rica. Um, so what we'll do is that we'll capture the shark. This one is a tiger shark. Um, this one is about 14 feet long. And then we would attach these satellite transmitters on the dorsal fins of these sharks. And what that does is that once the shark goes a little, a breach the surface, it will send a signal up to the satellite system. So we'll catch a shark, get measurements, you know, and then deploy the tag and then release the shark in a healthy condition, of course and then we'll track where the shark goes. So I'll show you this one. So if you follow this yellow line, this is a white tip um, shark and it went all the way from the coastline of Costa Rica to, sorry, no, no, this one, this one we actually started on Cocos Island. We, we tagged him here and he went all the way, this is like 500, 600 miles within four weeks. Um, to get to the mainland area of Costa Rica. Um, so what this does is help us to figure out where to protect. So if we, we don't just protect one area. So they went, went to the mainland to, to breed, you know, to, to pop and to raise the pups for a little bit. And then they go back to aggregate on Cocos Island. Now, if you only, you know, protected Cocos Island, would not be protecting the breeding ground. So eventually it's not protecting the shark because it has a wide range and we want to protect that corridor. So Costa Rican government is now changing where the marine protected areas because of this work. 
Um, this was a rendition that we did for one of the systems, this was in Portland. And what this involves is that we take thousands of photos, thousands of photos, and we work with Chris Institution of Oceanography um, in California. And we take thousands of photos in a particular way, and then we stitch them together using a supercomputer. And what that does, it provides you with a 3D rendition of, of the coral reef itself. So if you do this today, and you do this two years down the line or four years down the line, you can see what your management um, in terms of conservation is doing. You know, you can actually see the reef changing over time. Um, so with this kind of 3D rendition of the reef system, it can showcase, you know, what's happening with the reef. So you look at that palmata, it's very diseased. Look at the one versus what I showed you before on Pedro Bank very healthy and vibrant, and that one is very, very diseased. But what this gives you is a good snapshot of the entire reef system in a three-dimensional manner. So coral restoration is extremely important. So here we find a coral tree with small amounts of fragments um, that are taken from parent colonies, grown to a certain stage, then put back out on the reef, Here's another one. This one is from the Alligator Foundation, Marishi in Portland. This is um, Sagon Coral. This is what very, very important reef builder um, in, in the Caribbean. You know, you have to tend to them, you have to take care of them. They do get fouled with algae, so you have to go there with a tiny toothbrush and scrub them off and make sure they're nice and healthy. Of course, um, one of the things I worked on quite a bit um, is the lionfish, the invasive lionfish. And when we started the lionfish invasion um, research back in 2009, uh, we had just gotten to Jamaica. We started some work in Bahamas before um, to learn about it. But this creature pretty much exploded on our reef system. Um, luckily, with conservation methods and public awareness and you know, eat them to beat them campaigns, um, we got the numbers down to 50% of where it used to be. So it's a good sign, especially considering something that we produce every four days. Okay? And, you know, it looks beautiful. It's amazing to take photographs of. Uh, this is one of my photographs from um, I'm gonna, with the Kedja Bank. Um, but it shows you why we're in this problem now. It's a very, very flamboyant, attractive species. And that's why it was heavily thought out for the aquarium trade. So the needs of an aquarium trade and releasing accidentally a pet fish into the wild um, or introducing it and not knowing that it will cause a problem. Um, however, that was, you know, back in the 1980s, we're now feeling the effects of this problem because right now this species is all over the Atlantic and Caribbean, all the way down to South America and Brazil. And I think that's where I will end my talk. Thank you very, very much. Well, um, I think this is how I came up out <laughs> that presentation um, after exploring the depths. Thank you so much, Dr. Budu, for such a wonderful presentation and giving us this kind of experience and um, that this exposure to the aquatic world and what lies within the depth of the ocean. Many of us are just maybe kiddie pool professional swimmers. So, I mean, just to see this kind of thing on screen and just to imagine what it's like being out there, um, you know, it shows us even if we are not out there every day or doing the kind of work that you do, how much, how important the role that we have to protect our ocean and to protect marine life. And we wanna get engaged in that conversation actually for the remainder of this session, what we can do. But I want to throw out to our participants, please feel free to jump in. The floor is open. If you have any questions that can kick off this interactive segment, please go ahead and do so. If there are questions, we'll take them now. All right, um, so while in just in case um, people are, are kind of processing what is it that they'd want to start with first, what 
I wanted to, to um, you know, coming out the presentation, as I mentioned before, a lot of us, we won't have the expertise or even the ability. I mean, I grew up um, beside the coast. I can't swim. So there are going to be people like me and other persons who feel like I'm not able to swim. How do I have a vested interest in protecting marine life? Is there a role for me in caring for life below water while on land? Well, I mean, you know, um, Jamaica, as, many, as well as many of the other Caribbean islands, um, the majority of the population cannot swim, okay? But you do interact with marine life. Uh, people use it for food, people use it for enjoyment, for example, a glass bottom boat ride, and everybody benefits from it, especially on island, the functional aspect of it. Um, you can be an ambassador for the ocean without even looking under the ocean. You can you know, link up with the organizations that are actually underwater doing the work, find out these key messages, find out what's going on, what's current, what are some of the recommendations, and help broadcast it. Put it out on social media, help people to make intelligent choices in terms of how they're eating, um, you know, choose a more sustainable fish. You know, don't buy lobsters out of season, don't buy small fish, come on, you know? These are decisions that you can take. And, you know, a lot of the time when I have a conversation with someone about, you know, why are you buying that small fish? Oh, well, it's already dead, you know? Yeah, but that kind of attitude, but continue to be shot by a fisherman because they can get sales for it. Um, but until you say, hey, you know what? I'm not eating fire fish anymore because I don't believe that we should be, or I'm not eating small fish, or I'm not going to be eating lobsters out of season. You know, you can make that decision and you know, dig it up on social media, but get the right messages out. You know, the last thing you want to have is people spending, you know, mixed messages and getting all confused because that doesn't help anyone. So you can get involved. You know, there are many things on land as well, you know, in knee high water, such as seagrass, you know, restoration and mangrove restoration, beach cleanups that you can get involved in as well. You know, you don't have to be 60 feet underwater to be um, helping the ocean that is that is so true and as you mentioned about you know helping to get the word out i do remember even y4sd we had a lionfish fry before um, as part of the say the part fish campaign and i remember going to a restaurant and the parrot fish was the only fish that was on the menu and i said i won't eat it and my friends were intrigued and that gave an opportunity to share with them the reason behind that so just to um you know to support what you were saying it does make sense for us yeah. to raise a conversation um i think joni has a question um, to pose to, to you, Dr. Budu. Joni, you can feel free to unmute your microphone. Hi, Dr. Budu. So as was stated, we do have the Save the Parrot Fish campaign, but I found that a lot of Jamaicans, even in speaking with everybody, has no idea the different stages of development of these fish, and we just catch anything and eat anything. Now, our suggestion was something seasonal, similar to what we do with conch. What would be your suggestions moving forward? Because most people are against a ban on parrot fish. What do you suggest as a conservation method? Well, um, you know, this is something that I've actually tabled at policy meetings with fishers. So I sit on the fishers board. Um, one of the things that we, we the science suggests especially for Jamaica, we're so depleted right now. Um, putting in a, a temporary ban may work. So ban it for a several number of years, allow the fish stocks to come up. And while you're allowing the fish stocks to come up, um, put in the measurements, sorry, put in the measures with respect to a minimum size and a maximum size. And I say minimum size and maximum size. I mean, you can, everybody can understand the minimum size. You know, do not take a prior fish that's too small because it hasn't reproduced effectively as yet. But the maximum size also works. There's something called a slot limit, where you're only taking out a certain size class out of the population. When the parrot fish has survived, and gone into what you call, you know, a super breeder. Um, that's the one that you want to have remaining. You want the parrot fish to be producing and producing. The larger the parrot fish, the more prolific a producer it will be. And because it has survived through several stresses, it's actually good genes 
that you want to go into the next generation. So, you know, having that kind of slot limit would work. Um, in an ideal world, yeah, ban it outright. Honestly, um, if I had my way, ban it outright. I think we need to make more intelligent choices. Um, the discussion is, well, you know, we use fish pots and we're catching uh, everything, fire fish everything. So you need to change the gear. Yeah, simple as that. Fire fish pots are banned in many countries because it's so indiscriminate. It catches everything. So, you know, it, it, it's, uh, you have to look at the entire fishery and make the right decisions. It may mean changing gear types. It may mean, you know, expanding fish sanctuaries and you can do those things. So you don't have to necessarily focus only on the parrot fish, focus on all herbivores, all fish species have size limits for every fish species. You know, small snappers should not be taken. Small doctor fish should not be taken either. You know, so enforce that. Um, Jamaica is a very indisciplined country. I love my country very, very much. But uh, when I compare how people react to environmental laws, you know, in Jamaica versus other countries. I think we can do a whole lot more in Jamaica with just a little bit more knowledge and appreciation for it. Davian, oh, sorry, thank you for that response. Felicia has a question as well, and then we'll take, so it'll be Felicia and then we'll take a question from Davian. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, hi, Dr. Budu. Um, first, let me just commend you on the pillar of, um, you know, information that you've presented. Wonderful pictures, wonderful presentation. Now, um, in 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 extension to Joni's question with regards to, you know, the parrot fish and and getting persons on board to see the importance of, um, you know, sustaining the um, underwater life and to an extension life on, you know, life above the water. Now, you mentioned that Jamaica is a very quote unquote, you know, in discipline country, but how is it that you um, gradually sensitize the common man in learning to um, appreciate the, um, the movement of sustainability in terms of the marine life, because it, 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 it's not going to be as easy as just putting the information out there and um, rooting for a ban, but it has to start from a, a level in which we're able able to develop, I mean, strategies in which we can actually um, sensitize even the persons that are, you know, coming from like the primary or the basic school level. So we create this culture. So what are some of the ways you think we can actually um, drive that movement in sensitizing, um, you know, the common man? Well, you know, let me tell you. Um... There is public education, a tremendous value for public education, sensitization, awareness, and at all levels, from adults to kids, you know, we have to tackle every single level. Um, the, the problem is that public education awareness can only go so far and no more. And I'm telling you this first and I mean, I've had situations running MPAs where, you know, the majority of the community, 90% of the community are on board, um, reluctantly, but eventually when they saw the results, they were all on board. But there's always a 10% of persons who see this as an opportunity to benefit themselves. You know, they know what's going on. They know that they need, they need to do these things. It's not a matter of education. It's just come back down to enforcement of some of these things, um, you know, for the greater good, uh, for, the, for the good of the entire community. And the thing with ocean laws, um, everyone thinks the sea belongs to them. And everything in the sea belongs to them to do what they would like to do, just across the board. So for you to tell them, hey, you know, I, you can't go and fish in this area, or you can't take this fish out of the area, it's something that requires not just education, but some amount of enforcement as well. So it, it, has, it has to be, you know, several sectors of society, several things happening at the same time, not just education, but also back into the enforcement. 
Thank you, um, Dr. Budu. And now, Dave, you can ask your question. Okay, thank you so much, Dana Lane. Good evening, Dr. Budu. Good evening, everyone. Okay, Dr. Budu, um, how do we limit harm to our marine life? Also, do you think that Jamaica and the wider Caribbean would benefit from more fish sanctuaries? All right, so the first question is just a wide question. That's a it's like a lecture on itself, man. Um, so, you know, the bottom line is, I think there's enough science to tell us how to protect our ocean and to protect our marine life. All we have to do is listen to the science. The science is very objective, yeah, right? Um, I've worked on several development projects for hotels and cruise shipping ports all across the world. And when a developer comes to me and says, hey, you know, I'd like a marine survey to be done uh, to see if this development can go there. I say, hey, listen, man, I'm gonna go there. I'm gonna tell you exactly what's there. Now, I'm gonna measure it with the same ruler that I measure everything else. Um, so don't expect me to come back and try and make a case for your development. It is what it is, right? So listen to the science. That, that's, that's, that's a short answer I can give you, Davian listen to the science you know it's very consistent it's, it's very supported it's non-emotive and that's probably one of my faults i'm not a very emotional person i'm a very scientific person um, i don't let emotion get into it i love the ocean but i don't make it you know cloud everything else um, i stick to the science if the number is the number then the number is the number you know um, we just have to accept that and move on from that and make 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 strides for that they're talking about changing policy. They're talking about changing management um, system, regulation built on science, all right? Now, um, with respect to fish sanctuaries, yes, we should be at 30% of our marine space being under protection, 30%. Anybody want to guess how much we protect in a no-take zone in Jamaica? 2%, if that much by now. Two, only 2% 2 of, of our marine space is a no-take zone. All right, a replenishment zone. Um, we need to get that up to at least 20% or 25%. If not, try and go for that 30%. All right, it's a 2030 goal of 30% for marine protection. We need to get on that, on that area because you're talking about 30% of the space providing for the other 70% the of the space. That's what that means, you know. All right, that area will produce for the other 70% <clears throat> that you're using. So when we start at 2%, come on, you know, that's a, that's a, you know, it's a very lame 2%, to be honest with you. And so we have to push. The good thing is, I mean, for Jamaica itself, I mean, there's a commitment to increase fish sanctuaries. We need funding for fish sanctuaries because that's what's working. Fish sanctuaries are the, one, are the only thing that's working, right? And not just in Jamaica, but many countries in the world. That's the only thing that's working, right? Season, I mean, lobster season not working. Conch is now banned. Why conch is banned? Because the numbers are low. The numbers are too low to support the fishery, right? What told you that? The science told you that, right? So listen to the science. You know, listen to the science. It may not be what you want to hear. It may not be a popular decision, but it's the right decision. So we just need to do, what, just do what's right. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Davian, for engaging. Too, definitely too little. Um, and from Davian, we're going to pass the mic to Deidre. Deidre? Okay. Um, Carrie Ann also had a question. Okay, carry on. Or Claudia, Claudia, would, would you like to pose your question? Are you hearing me? Okay, yes, yes, we can hear you, Karen. Okay, right. Um, I was saying thank you very much for that presentation, Dr. Badu. And my question is twofold. I wanted to find out to what extent are we using technologies um, or technology based on what you had showed in the presentation about tracking the shark um, to see where um, you know, he does the 
or she, the shark, does the reproductive um, processes to in order to conserve that area. So to what extent are we also applying some of those technologies to track where we can also conserve? And then my other question is centered around ghost fishing. So a lot of um, the conversation that I've been hearing earlier speaks to individual responsibility um, of persons really helping to protect the environment, but also to bring the um, conversation about the importance of um, persons who are actually using the marine environment on a daily basis, which is our fishermen and our fisherwomen, to what extent um, is ghost fishing impacting our marine life or our fishing industry in Jamaica? Thank you. Okay, um, well, Carrie, I'm afraid you remember my first question again. I was so focused on the second one. <laughs> the first question was to what extent are we using the technology that you had ah, shown yes, 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 yes. right of the tracking of the shark? Okay, all right. Uh, see, I'm getting old now, so my memory is not very good. Um, so, you know, with respect to technology, we are not using it as much in Jamaica as we should be. Right? Technology exists where we can put satellite tags. I mean, I've done it in Costa Rica. Um, but it's very, very expensive. It's, uh, one of those tags was 2,000 US dollars, right? Um, a lot of information comes from those tags, but it's very, very expensive. Um, that project costed us 150,000 US dollars, and we taxed 45 sharks, right? And we're working a year 500 miles away from the mainland, so it's very expensive to, to logistics. But it provided so much information you'd not believe, so much information that we can change policy and change regulation for conservation of sharks. Um, what's been done in Jamaica is pretty much what I showed you this video clip of, where we deploy these cameras underwater and we will see what comes by. And that's not even being done at a very regular rate. Uh, we had a small project and we did that project and got the research findings and put the paper out. All right. Um, so yeah, we definitely need to do more with technology. And technology exists, you know, it does exist um, um, a lot. It's very easy to get those technologies. I'm sorry, remind me of your second question again. Right the second going. question was centered around ghost fishing and to what ah, extent fishing, is yes, that yes, right? Know. Ghost fishing is a big problem. They have been a problem for a long time. We have nets, we have pots, and we have long lines sometimes that are out there just keep fishing. Um, that's something that, you know, we talk about personal responsibility. You have to put regulations into that as well. I'm sorry. Um, you know, I, I've, I've told fishermen personally, don't put your pots on a reef. Don't put it on the edge. You know, put it in a sand patch where it can be easily recovered, etc. But they do not, you know, um, because they feel that they can catch more fish if they put it right on the reef or right on the edge. Uh, a little, you know, they, they set it a little bit wrong and then it falls off the edge and they can't recover it. There's a big problem. There's so many ghost, ghost traps out there fishing right now. So many. We've done cleanup events of ghost traps. And it, it's funny, you know, you know, you talk to the fishermen, for example, we've done it in coastal cleanup days. So, hey, you know, why don't you come across and, you know, donate some time on your boat and we, we'll dive and we, we'll tie them up and you just pull them up and bring them back to land. And, you know, we have to end up paying the fishermen to do that, to clean up their own trash. You know, it's just unbelievable the kind of, you know, the, the kind of, oh, the, the responsibility, I would say, goes. You know, this is your trap. Might not be yours specifically, but it's a fishing trap. One that you also use. You know, and as a community of fishermen, uh, they don't really act like a community. You know, it's, it's every man for himself or the person for himself. Um, so it's, it's the whole, you know, taking responsibility. And I think, I mean, you hear me talk about this enforcement thing quite a bit in this, in this session, but it's a real need. You know, you just have to enforce it quite a bit. Education, yes, perfect, but you have to enforce as well. And ghost fishing is definitely something that can be enforced. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Badu. And thanks, Kerian, for that contribution. Um, 
And Claudia, are you still there? Or if not, we have another mm -hmm. question. I'm still here. Okay, Hi. okay. Good evening, everyone. Hi, Dr. Badu. Thank you for your presentation. I have a question. Um, two questions. How many fish sanctuaries are there in Jamaica? And does that include like the, the banks and the keys? And the other question is, where can we find these resources, you know, that we can equip ourselves with the scientific knowledge so that we can, you know, effect change and, you know, and some cost effective resources at that too? For people like who, okay. especially university students who don't necessarily have the money to pay for the journal stories and so forth. Okay, so you know, you guys keep giving me the long question. What's the first one again? <laughs> okay, how many fish sanctuaries? Fish sanctuaries, yeah. yeah, I got it. I remember now. Okay, 18. There are 18 fish sanctuaries in Jamaica. Uh, we're adding as we go along. Um, I propose about four of them recently. So hopefully by next year, we might have four more sanctuaries. Um, with respect to finding information, so let me tell you something. Uh, you know, when I, was, when I was in graduate school at UE, I used to go in the science library and I used to you know, flip through the little catalog things and try and find articles and books and everything. But you guys have a tremendous resource nowadays. It's called Google. You jump on and you can ask Siri to search for something for you as well. You have information at your fingertips like never before, right? And what's even more so is that you can find the abstracts of these scientific um, research online. And then there's an author that you can communicate with. So, and there's so many articles that are freely available online, okay? So I would say, do a Google search, what you wanna find out, it's right there at your fingertips. You can do it on your phone while you're in, while you're walking on wherever, it's so easy to find, right? So I encourage all of you. Uh, one of the things that I implemented here in California is all my team takes one hour out of their day and they do a research on a particular topic. Just search for a paper, take the time out, read it, analyze the paper, and we meet once a week and everybody gets five minutes to talk about the paper. That's something that you, know, you can do as a group. You know, it's called a journal club but it forces you to read. It forces you not just to wait on your time, you know, have a little spare time, yeah, let me pick up a journal. No, schedule the time, do the research, get it done, all right? But information is so, it, there's so much information out there is not funny. So the science is not limited, okay? okay thank you. Okay, thank you. And our final question for tonight, um, someone from was in the chat uh, to Dr. Vudu. Do you work alongside any coastal and environmental engineers? And if so, do you have any suggestions for practices or infrastructure that would be beneficial to marine life? Is that too long? <laughs> no, 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 it's not. All right, so... Um, <clears throat> With respect to, yeah, I, I do work with Ms. Warner a bit. Uh, right now we're doing a climate change project uh, for Jamaica. Um, you know, it's analyzing what's there and analyzing what we can do about it. You know, there are soft solutions such as, you know, you know coral restoration or maybe um, seagrass restoration. But quite often, you know, when you are seeing these specs of coastal erosion, for example, uh, usually it's at a point where you need to intervene a lot more. In other words, you need to intervene on um, a structural basis by putting hard structures in place along with your soft solution. So, you know, never limit yourself, okay, I'm not going to plant coral. No, never, never limit yourself like that. Sometimes you just need like a kick start and your head start. And there are ways to do it to not just, you know, put something down anywhere. There's a methodology, there's science behind that as well in terms of, you know, water currents and direction, uh, sediment deposits. So you can have an engineer design a coastline for you quite easily, but very expensively, uh, and have that implemented, but you can recreate um, those kind of things, of course. Did I miss All a right. different question? No. Oh. Um... 
I think you probably answered it about the suggestions or practices for infrastructure that will be beneficial to marine yeah, life. Yeah. So, yeah, right. Okay, and if there are no further questions, I think we can say we've come to the end of what was a very engaging presentation and definitely it's always very refreshing when we're exposed to, to new things and we appreciated the tour that we received in the earlier segment and of course we are no more assured of the greater role that we can play even if you are not a marine professional, we do see how the road is cut out for us to, to protect our marine life and to do what we can, especially as proponents and champions of sustainable development. And so we want to say thank you so much to Dr. Budu for, for taking me. the time. Thank you for taking the time and also arranging the presentation in the way that you did from just your background and we're seeing that live environment, it's, it's really appreciated. And the information, of course, that you shared, it's not just about the facts, I'm sorry, I mean, it's not just about the novelty, but the facts and also you reminded us, listen to the science, definitely gonna take that with us. Before we close out, I'm gonna invite everyone, it has been shared in the chat, to go on to the survey link and complete a 30 second survey before we leave. So I'm giving you 30 seconds to have that done. In the meantime, I want to once again acknowledge our sponsors for this event, JPS and Jamaica Rums. We say thank you very much for rallying behind such an important cause. And I want to remind you that tomorrow we'll be jumping into our next segment, your agriculture lifestyle, life on land. Then we have after that on Monday, your wellness lifestyle, mind, body, and soul. And then finally, your sustainable lifestyle, healthy home. So please share with a friend, share throughout your respective groups and continue to use the hashtags. And I think perhaps 30, I'm gonna just say 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. I know my counting was a little bit fast, but we expect everyone was able to fill out the surveys. Thank you once again for joining uh, and making day two of the Y4SD conference 2020 a success. I am Dana Lynn and it was a pleasure being your host. Good evening. Bye, guys. Bye.